Advent 2, the second and four Sundays preceding Christmas, the day of incarnation, Christ's birth, the exquisite communion of divinity and humanity. Michael Fitzpatrick at our wonderful Advent Eve event preached about the power of the incarnation. Rebecca Lyman last Sunday on Advent 1 preached about gratitude, preached about transformation and renewal, and that suffering has a point uh, based on those apocalyptic readings from Advent 1. So I continue today on Advent 2 in the apostolic succession of all believers, if you will, past and present, grateful for this community, this body, this church. On this Advent Sunday, we can celebrate John the Baptist, the prophet, for his truthful words about the Messiah, and St. Nicholas, who embodied his faith in the Messiah. St. Nicholas Feast Day, December 6th, the day we believe Nicholas of Myra, Greek bishop, born in the third century, died. 343. This week at staff meeting, we were talking and wondering if there was a hymn that we could sing about St. Nicholas, and there is, there's no traditional famous hymn. We eventually came up with one. We'll sing it at the end of our service. But in the meantime, I joked, why don't we just sing Santa Claus is coming to town? <laughs> Santa Claus is a saint, right? We all know that. Uh, that from the Dutch, Sinterklaas. Is Ludwig here? Ludwig's not here today. Sinterklaas. And we all know the song, right? <laughs> you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's... Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good. See, you love it. Everybody's singing. Is, that, is it okay to sing uh, that song in a sacred space? Yes, because we come full circle, haven't we? That song about St. Nicholas who followed the Christ. We're coming historically and culturally full circle. And in a, in a way, we're following someone whose legacy will not be denied, like St. Francis, right? There's a source. There's a source there. There's a reason why people have statues in their gardens or why we sing about the right jolly old elf coming down the chimney. The Night Before Christmas, right? It was written by who? C. Clement Moore, who was? An, an Episcopal priest. An Episcopal priest. It turns out that Santa Claus is Coming to Town was written by two Tin Pan Alley uh, men and Broadway composers around 1932 during the Great Depression, right? The Great Depression was 29 to 39. And originally, some of the early versions, like Eddie Cantor's 1934 radio show, had verses in the song encouraging listeners to be charitable and help those who were hurting, those in need, at Christmas. We see in the standard lyrics that we just sang, obviously they contain traditional warnings playfully, judgment, if you will. You better watch out. He's making a list. But lost is an indication of what defines niceness. This song was covered by hundreds of people. That's why we know it so well, right? From the Jackson Five to Mariah Carey, Frank Sinatra. There's apparently a version with a digital vocal from Frank Sinatra with a live Cindy Lauper, which thankfully I've never heard. 
I saw Bruce Springsteen sing this song live at Winterland in the late 70s. He was, it was part of his show in October and November. The universal appeal for Santa Claus reflects humanity's universal soul. But let's not forget the origin, the source, the loving heart of God. St. Nicholas is known in the Orthodox Church as the wonder worker, the worker of wonder. He lived during a crazy contentious time, born into a wealthy Christian family, but like St. Francis, comes to hear a call beyond the material to the spiritual and incarnational awareness of God's presence, God's heart, God's hope. He gives his money away. He becomes a priest, later a bishop. Legendary stories about him bear breakthrough to illuminate a compassionate, caring person who embodies, who incarnates his faith in a way that inspires others, that saves. The most famous one, of course, is of secretly leaving gold for a father of three daughters who has lost his wealth and whose daughters have no dowry to marry, and so the story goes, could very well be forced into prostitution even to survive. And all three receive a gift from St. Nicholas to escape that soul-destroying outcome. Hence, in addition to being the patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, unmarried people, and students. He is the patron saint of prostitutes. It is said, quote, his reputation evolved among the pious, end quote. But we know very little, very little fact, very little details about his real life. Only the spiritual result of the communion between faith and action, belief and behavior. Similar to John the Baptist's point in his prophetic message today, our own Katie Fanton wrote a wonderful reflection in our Advent devotional. If you haven't read this online or picked one up, please do. There's wonderful reflections here. I want to read you a paragraph that Katie wrote about John the Baptist for this week. Quote, he was pretty quirky in his food choices and his message was not the best marketing for a happy-go-lucky faith. In fact, he was preaching a hard message of repentance. But for whatever reason, he attracted droves of people. It seems that people were looking for something. Maybe people were tired of the old way of faith. Maybe they were looking for something concrete and real, something they could embrace that would lead to tangible change in their lives. But not everyone was truly looking. As John saw the religious leaders approach, he laid into them as their reputation seemed to precede them. Even before they had a chance to speak, John reminded them that they were not true seekers. He knew their expression of faith hadn't made them into people who reflect the compassion and love of God. The fruit they were producing wasn't bringing life. Fruit that keeps with repentance expresses itself as love, compassion, and the grace of God, not judgment and the oppression of those in need. While John's words were harsh here, they present an opportunity. Lovely. Thank you, Katie. So John calls the religious leaders vipers, and here is where our Advent readings force us into a holy awareness of repentance and renewal, of purgation and promise. He says the Messiah is coming and I am unworthy to tie his sandals. And he will preach a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, purging, renewing, beginning a conversion, a change, a transformation of life. Like Francis and Nicholas, legends whose lives were changed, whose souls were on fire with compassion and mercy and a holy, self-giving, sacrificial love leading 
to a holy joy that no material challenge could destroy. So yeah, this goes beyond being naughty or nice. It's about an imperative to follow, to stop our anxious worry, our furtive fear, and to be, to greet with joy the coming of Christ as our colic reminds us this morning. In other words, to believe in salvation, to believe that we can be healers, a salve to others. Like Julian of Norwich, Rebecca mentioned last week, living in the midst of plague and pandemic herself and crying out that God's love, that awareness of that love will make all things well. Being healers like Francis who kisses and embraces the leper. Being healers like Nicholas who gave to the poor and helped save them from destruction. By the grace of God, these saints remind us of the true Christ and Christ's call rising above the institutional failures, the positional powers misused, to powerfully renew people's hope. The incarnation of Jesus the Christ is a miracle to which we hold in order to say it is possible to be human and to be holy, to be human and to be good, to be human and to be forgiven, to be human and to be renewed, to be human and to believe that Christ is within us. And we can give birth to hope when we move through suffering and proclaim and act as healers in God's name. So indeed, Advent is preparing for birth, the birth within us, the birth of Christ into the world, into history, into culture, into our lives, here, now, full circle. So you better watch out. Watch out for grace. You better not cry. Move beyond fear. You better not pout when your pride is hurt. Surrender to God's grace. Move beyond fear. I'm telling you why. Because grace is here, now, present. We can be healers. We can be givers. We can leave a legacy. So I want to end today with a prayer about St. Nicholas that when St. Nicholas appears today, uh, he will share a calling card to young people, those less young. And on the back is a prayer, or on the inside is a prayer, actually. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the example of St. Nicholas who fed the hungry, brought hope to the imprisoned, gave comfort to the lost, and taught the truth to all. May we strive to imitate him by putting you first in all we do. Give us the courage, love, and strength of St. Nicholas so that like him we may serve you through loving other people and the world. In the name of Christ, amen.